This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 35 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome to you. I am so glad that you have found the podcast and you are joining us today for this episode. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And it has just absolutely been a gorgeous week here on the Homestead. We actually got some rain and it had been dry for a little bit. And uh, we got some rain this week and it's just amazing how rain will make a garden pop. You can water and water and water, but there's just something about that rain. The way plants react to rain versus how they react to water, it's just a huge difference, at least in my experience. And this week we had some rain and boy, the gardens are popping. So without further ado, let's jump right into this week's Homestead Happenings and I will bring you up to date with what's going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead. As I said, things in the garden are really coming to life. The square foot gardens right now are just absolutely looking gorgeous. I've been posting some pictures up on our Facebook and Instagram accounts and on our website, thehomesteadjourney.net. So if you want to follow along, definitely you're going to want to check out our social media accounts and uh, like or follow uh, us on those accounts. But boy, like I was saying, we got a little bit of rain this week and just the difference that has made is just absolutely amazing. We have been enjoying some lettuce uh, from uh, the square foot gardens. We've been enjoying some spinach out of the garden and uh, just having some great salads, really enjoying um, the fresh produce and looking forward to enjoying some more in the not too distant future. The lettuce is just, we. I've got some butter crunch up there, folks, that is just absolutely sweet, sweet, sweet lettuce. It is just so good. I, I just, I'll be up there weeding or doing something and I'll just stop by and just grab it and pick it and just eat it. It is, oh. It is so good. So good. Anyhow, we uh, got some more stuff planted in the roost out bed this week. So that's just about fully planted. I have a few more things that I want to put in there, but it's going to be a little bit. What I want to do is put in some uh, Brussels sprouts, but I want them to come on in the fall so that they'll get a little bit of a frost, which just really sweetens those Brussels sprouts up. So we'll be putting them in here in a couple of weeks. I also put up trellises this week in our Ruth Stout beds, and I had a couple of uh, our square foot garden raised beds that didn't have trellises on them. Now, what I use for trellising is cattle panels on T-posts. It is a very cost-effective way to do it. Uh, it's much cheaper, in my opinion, than going out and buying a bunch of different individual tomato cages. And uh, they're just indestructible. You use them year after year after year after year. Even with, you know, some of those tomato cages, after a while, they just fall apart. They get bent. Um, I, I just don't care for them. And then stakes, if you buy wooden stakes, eventually they rot. To me, the cattle panels are just absolutely the way to go. They work great for cucumbers. They work great for uh, pole beans really anything climbing, they work really, really well for. And so we did that. I also, last year, had started doing some arches in the uh, in the square foot garden area. And I had, had arched over one cattle panel. And I don't even remember why, but I only did one between a couple of beds. So I finished that up this week where I put in two more. And so I've got this really beautiful archway between two beds. And uh, so that I think is going to look really, really nice. I've got some runner beans going up that, some scarlet runner beans. I've got some uh, cucumbers. I've got some other pole bean varieties in there. I think it's going to really look awesome once they really start climbing up uh, that trellis. 
Now, with the rain, the downside to that is the weeds. And in my square foot garden, uh, I have had a lot of problem with weeds this year. And I think it's because I didn't get my compost hot enough to kill off the weed seeds. And so when I put compost in my square foot gardens, I also seeded it with some weeds. So it's been a little bit tricky trying to keep ahead of it um, this year. My goal is to get my compost hot so that I kill off those weed seeds. But uh, so I've been spending some time up in the square foot garden doing some weeding. But I, I don't know if I'm just getting old or what, but I'm actually finding, I'm not going to say that I enjoy weeding. Okay, please, please don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. <laughs> but I don't hate it as much as I used to. Um, there's just something very cathartic about being out there in the garden. And uh, sometimes I'll I'll have a, a podcast in. But, you know, this week I didn't have the headphones in. I was just out there enjoying the sounds of the birds and the traffic. We, we do live quite a ways off the road, but you can still hear the traffic. It is a, a rather busy road. And uh, so, of course, listening to the traffic. Um, but listening to the birds and just enjoying being out in the garden. It's kind of trying to take my own advice from last week. <laughs> enjoying the homestead. And even though I was doing a task, I was really trying to just enjoy my time in the garden. And I really, really did. I did enjoy it as much as anyone can enjoy weeding. Now, speaking of last week's podcast, again, trying to take my own advice and build some beautiful things. This week, I did a couple of things. First of all, in the square foot gardens and in the roost out bed, I planted flowers. I planted marigolds. I planted some, I think, is it is it nasturtiums? I'm not sure how you pronounce them, but I planted those. And another thing that we did is I built a, I'm going to call it a design element. What I did is I had a door that I had found down in my grandfather's old pig pen. And it had a window in it. And so what I did is I kind of cleaned that up and I, I affixed it to some, um, post T posts that I had put in the ground. And then I put a window box on it and it just came out really, really nice. I did put pictures up on our social media accounts. So check it out. I really, really was happy with how it came out, but it's just something that created some beauty, at least in my mind, <laughs> in my eyes within the garden. And I just look forward to doing some other things like that throughout the, uh, the year. My son and I on Saturday, uh, well, Friday and Saturday, we put up uh, some fencing that we had gotten from some friends, uh, some chain link fencing to create a run for our turkeys. Now, you may ha remember a couple of weeks ago, we put them out in a coop, but I wanted to get them outside on some grass. And so we built this really, really long run that goes along the edge of one of the pig paddocks. And the turkeys just really seem to be enjoying that. So that really was another nice thing uh, that we got done this week so that those turkeys can get out and enjoy the great outdoors and get some of that grass. Finally, this week, I finally got around to putting roosts in the mobile coop. I've been wanting to do that for a while and just hadn't found time. And so now my pullets have roosts. So I'm very happy about that, and uh, they're really growing out well. Um, they're funny, funny birds. It's just, it's so much fun to watch them. And again, listening to those sickly crows as those roosters, those young cockerels are learning how to crow, is kind of comical, but just really enjoying the homestead, really trying to take time to enjoy the beauty that is 3B Farm and Homestead. Anyhow, that's what's been going here on our homestead. What's been going on on yours? I'd love to hear from you. Drop me a, a line, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net or ping us on social media. I'd love to hear how things are going on your homestead. All right, let's pop over to this week's Charting the Course. As you might recall, a couple of weeks ago, we processed our meat birds and sent them off to freezer camp. <laughs> In the process of doing so, I had posted some pictures of some of our 
poultry processing equipment to our social media accounts, and I really got a lot of feedback and a lot of questions with regards to some of the gear that we use. And it got me to thinking, I did a a series not too long ago on raising chickens. I did a, a an episode on raising meat birds. I really didn't talk much about poultry processing equipment. And so today I'm going to do my best to try to rectify that mistake. I'm going to share with you a little bit about the gear that we use. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I like, maybe what I don't like. But before we get into that, let me simply preface this by saying that if you are new to processing poultry, I am sure that the task in and of itself seems rather daunting. If you did not grow up around it, if you have never seen it done in real life, if you've never had anybody show you how to do it, probably the process in and of itself feels rather daunting. And then all of this equipment on top of it may make you feel a little bit overwhelmed. Take a deep breath, okay? Because I'm going to talk to you about poultry processing equipment today, but I'm also going to share with you a dirty little secret. And that is that you do not need any of the equipment that I'm going to talk about today to be able to successfully and safely process poultry. You see, my grandfather processed thousands, literally thousands of chickens throughout his years, and he did not have any of the equipment that I'm going to talk about. His his setup was rather rudimentary. It was very, very simple. He dispatched chickens using the old chopping block and hatchet. He scalded the chickens using a pot of water that he had heated on the stove. He plucked the birds by hand. And his evisceration station was a 55-gallon drum on top of which he balanced a piece of a discarded kitchen countertop. That was his system. And he used that for literally decades and processed literally thousands of chickens using that system. And I say all of that, folks, because you can look at the gear that we're going to talk about today, and you can look at poultry processing setups that many, many people have, and you, and, and you can come away with the thought that you have to have all of that gear in order to be able to successfully process poultry. And I'm here to tell you that all of that gear is great, and it serves a purpose, and it can make the process more efficient, It can make it easier, so to speak, but there's not a single person, I shouldn't say, obviously I don't know everybody that processes poultry, but the people that I know that process poultry, they have built out their systems over years. They didn't just go out one day and buy all of this gear. And so it's okay to start with a more rudimentary type system, okay? You don't need to go out and buy all of this gear at one whack. In fact, today what I'm hoping to do is not just tell you about the gear that I use and and why I like it or maybe why I don't like it, because there are a few pieces that if I had to do over again, I probably wouldn't buy the same thing. But my goal is also to help you understand maybe where you should start as you begin building out your system. In this episode's show notes, I have tried to include links to all of the gear that we're going to talk about. Now, in some cases, the exact piece of gear that I purchased is no longer available. So I tried to find something that was equivalent. Uh, In other cases, you can't buy the gear I'm going to talk about. They are things that I built. And so I've either tried to provide links to the plans that you can purchase or links to pictures so that you can look at it and maybe build it yourself. Some of these links are affiliate links. They're the Amazon links are affiliate links. So if you click on those and buy something, that is a great way to support the Homestead Journey podcast. There are other links that I am providing to you that I don't get any kind of commission from whatsoever. I'm just trying to provide you with a service so that you can buy Uh, what I would consider a good product 
at a great price. So having said all of that, let's jump right in. And really what we're going to try to do is work from the beginning of the process through the end and talk about the various pieces of equipment that you're going to need as you process poultry. So the first thing I want to talk about are crates. In many cases, people are going to be processing their poultry in an area that is different than where they have raised their poultry. And in many cases, it's quite a distance from where you've been raising your chickens to where you're processing your chickens. And so how are you going to get your chickens from where you've been raising them down to where you process them? Now, in my case, quite honestly, that's not an issue because where we raise them isn't that far from where we process them. And so generally speaking, what I have done in the past is just go and get chickens when I needed them. Now, this time around, as I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, my son really helped speed up the process because he was the one going and fetching the chickens. But for many people, Again, the distance from where you have been raising them to where you're processing them is a long ways. And so some people will go out and invest in or buy plastic crates, chicken crates. Um, they're available on Amazon. They're available in a bunch of different places. Now, to be honest with you, I have never purchased those because even when I was taking my chickens to be processed, I was using whatever kind of dog kennel, dog crate, rabbit cage, whatever I had laying around, boxes, um, I was using totes, uh, whatever I could put chickens in, that's what I was using. So I would keep an eye on, because in my opinion, it really is a good practice anyhow to have some spare dog crates or kennels around on your homestead, just in case you have an animal that's injured and needs to kind of be segregated. Um, they, they come in handy. And so if you can find those, and a lot of times you can find those really cheap on Craigslist. I found them free along the side of the road. Um, keep an eye out for those. But if you want something that is going to stack easily, depending on the number of chickens that you are processing, certainly you might want to think about getting crates. Um, but some kind of a container, uh, whether it's crates, cages, etc., is going to be helpful for you to be able to move the chickens from where you've been raising them to where you're going to process them. So now it is time to do the deed. It is time to dispatch these chickens. As I said earlier, my grandfather's methodology was the chopping block and a hatchet. And I started out processing poultry that way. I did not like that for a couple of reasons. Number one is because my hand-eye coordination is not the greatest in the world. And sometimes, no matter how hard you tried, you would have a bird that might twitch or move a little bit, and I just sometimes didn't get as clean of a kill as I liked. But beyond that, when you would put the bird down and let it run around literally as a chicken with its head cut off, I wasn't so much worried about it getting bruised. We never really had problems with that. But what I didn't like is as these chickens were tumbling around on the ground, they were accumulating all kinds of dirt and grass and just all of this nastiness that you would then have to rinse off or wash off. And I just didn't like that. So I got kill cones. Now, I actually bought a medium-sized kill cone and a friend of mine has a large, it might even be an extra large, I, I'd have to go look at it, uh, kill cone. And I actually like that better. Um, I've had problems with the medium not being quite big enough and having chickens pop out of it. And actually, I had one end up flopping down into where the pigs are because where I, where I keep one of the pigs um, is is kind of off to the side or behind the shed where I have the kill cones hanging. And I lost a chicken to the pig because I wasn't going to go fight him for it. <laughs> but the kill cones, what they will do is they will secure the birds and keep them from flopping out, getting onto the ground. Or at least that's the theory behind it. You kind of pull the head down through the bottom of it and... Some people will try to get fancy and there's a little device you can use to kind of stick them. My preferred method is just to take a knife and cut the heads all the way off. Bam, at that point, you, you know you have a clean kill and the 
bird is not suffering. So that's my preference. But you don't have to go out and buy kill cones. You can make, I've seen people make kill cones out of old traffic cones. I've seen people make kill cones out of laundry detergent bottles. I've seen them make them out of milk jugs. So depending on the size of the chickens that you're butchering, you just need something that will secure the, the chicken upside down where there's a hole in the bottom so its head can come out and then you can do the deed. But uh, I definitely do highly recommend kill cones. Whether or not you buy them, don't necessarily have to, but uh, I, I do prefer the kill cones uh, over the old chop and drop, shall we say, methodology. Now, one of the things you can do, some people will take a, a bungee cord and they will hook it on one side of the kill cone and up over the top around to the other side, which will also hold the chicken in the kill cone so it doesn't pop out. Um, and maybe I should do that with regards to my medium kill cone, but I've not had that problem with the larger one. Once you have dispatched the chicken, now at this point you are on to either scalding it if you're going to pluck it or skinning it. Um, some people will skin their chickens. I don't like to do that. I like to leave the skin on because I think it, it lends itself to a, a moister bird when you cook it up. Um, but it is, it's totally up to you how you want to do that. Uh, I always pluck, and so I it's on to the scalder. Now, when I first started doing this, um, my, my first go-round was doing like my grandfather did, which was heating water on the stove, breaking it, bringing it outside, and then dunking the birds. Well, it, it was, it works, but you had to keep running back and forth because the water kept cooling off. So not very long after, I went ahead and bought a turkey fryer. And that also works, but it's not great. The reason why I don't care for a turkey fryer as a scalder is, is two reasons. Number one is that I have found it very, very hard to maintain a good temperature. The scald is key. A good scald is in my in my opinion, it is, if not the most important, one of the most important things that you can do to be successful in processing poultry. If your water is too cold, the bird is not going to pluck well. And if the water is too hot, you're going to start seeing the skin tear in the plucker and you may start cooking your bird. None of those are good options. So maintaining a good temperature in your scalder is key. And I found with the turkey fryer that it was very, very difficult for me to do that. I would either get it too hot or I wouldn't, usually it was too hot. It was, it was hard for me to get it at that 140 range. The second reason why I don't like the turkey fryer as a scalder is as you're dunking the bird, you have to be very, very careful that you don't get any water to splash out or you're knocking out the flame and you're having to keep relighting the turkey fryer. Now, my buddy let me, my buddy Andy, let me borrow his fiberglass scalder. And let me tell you something, folks. I am in love with that thing. Now, when I say I'm in love with that thing, there are a couple of issues with it. It's not perfect, but it does maintain the temperature so much better than the turkey fryer did. Now, I will use the turkey fryer to get the water up to temp more quickly because if I put the water in the scalder, the water in the scalder, if I rely on the heating element in the scalder, it does take a long time for it to get up to that 140 range but it does maintain that temperature beautifully. So I, what I will do is I will use a turkey scalder and I will just heat the water a couple of times and keep dumping it in because that scalder holds a ton of water. And But it doesn't take that long for me to get water up the temp and for me to get going and rocking and rolling. Now the other downside to that scalder, it does have two elements in it, but you have to have those elements on two totally different circuits at least here at my house. If I try to pl plug both of those elements into the same circuits, I start tripping circuit breakers. So just keep that in mind. You can buy that scalder with one element or two. 
if I were to buy that Scalder, I would buy it with a single element because for me, the dual element has never, ever worked. But uh, Andy keeps his Scalder here, and so I've been able to use that over the last, uh, I don't know, three seasons. Absolutely love it. In fact, if I were to, a lot of people, when they think about buying poultry equipment for processing chickens, the first thing they think about is a plucker. And that's what I did. That was the first thing that I built was actually a plucker. We'll talk about that here in a second. But knowing what I know now, I would have invested in a scalder before I built the plucker. Because a good scald, as I said earlier, is key to a good pluck. And if you aren't getting that temperature correct, and you're struggling to maintain that temperature, your plucker is worthless. You're either not plucking birds clean because it's too cold, or you're tearing the crap out of them because... Well, literally and figuratively, <laughs> because it's too hot. So a scalder, boy, is key. So anyhow, on to a plucker. There are really three main types of chicken pluckers available on the market. There is one that is an attachment that goes on the end of a drill. And then there's these fingers, these rubber fingers that stick off of it. And you kind of run that along the chicken after you've scalded it. And as that's spinning, it plucks the uh, the feathers off of the bird. Now, some people will take those and take that and they'll, they'll put the um, drill in a stand to secure it. And then it kind of turns it into a tabletop plucker where you, instead of running the drill back and forth, the drill is now secured and you're running the uh, chicken over the fingers as they are spinning and that plucks it. You can also buy tabletop uh, pluckers that have um, the fingers that spin inside a case. And again, you just take your chicken and you kind of move it over these spinning fingers and it plucks the chicken for you. I don't have any experience with either one of those, the drill attachment or a table top plucker. Instead, the type of plucker that I have is a drum style plucker. I actually built my plucker. It's called a whiz bang chicken plucker. The links to the plans are in the show notes and it is built out of some uh, 55 gallon plastic barrels with rubber fingers and a motor that spins a plate. And what you do is you put the chicken in from the top and it tumbles around. And as that bottom plate is spinning, it's, the chicken is tumbling up against the uh, fingers that are coming out from the side and that plucks the chicken clean. Now, when I built my whiz bang plucker, I don't really recall whether or not the yard birds and Kitchener pluckers which are geared more towards the home market, were available. I was looking at the Featherman type pluckers, which usually are over a thousand bucks. And so that's why I went ahead and built my plucker is because I figured I could build it much cheaper than that. And I certainly was able to do so. However, if you aren't handy with putting things together, um, or if you don't have somebody who can weld uh, a rod to a plate to create the shaft for you and you have to go out and buy the shaft and the plate from uh, the whiz bang people, all of that stuff starts adding up. And if you have to go buy a motor, now I just bought a new motor. It was like 160 bucks. I started out using a pool pump motor that somebody gave me. But the problem with the pool pump motor was that, A, number one, the the uh, mounting bracket, one of the mounting brackets was rusted off on it. And number two is it actually was a 3,700 RPM motor instead of the 1,800 RPM motor that's recommended. And so I had to do a lot of math <laughs> and uh, a lot of work with pulleys uh, stepping up and stepping down to try to get the... Um, the rotations per minute, the RPMs, uh, to be correct and not too fast. And so I say all of that to say, well, I like my plucker. Um, I have to tinker with it. 
And if I had to do it over again, if I were to do something today, I probably would buy a Yardbird or Kitchener. It seems like they both have fairly good reviews. They are definitely not commercial grade pluckers. So if you are somebody who is looking at processing, you know, 500 birds three times a year, then you're probably not going to want to buy a yard bird. But if you're somebody who is processing 20 or 30 birds a couple of times a year, then a yard bird or a kitchener probably is going to work out well for you. If you're somebody who is planning on processing a lot more than that, then you may want to consider either building a whiz bang or looking into a commercial grade plucker um, that's going to cost you a little bit more money, but is designed for more use. But a plucker is definitely a good investment. However, it's something that you don't have to have. People have plucked chickens by hand for hundreds, if not thousands of years and enjoyed tasty chicken dishes as a result. So a plucker is a nice thing. But in my opinion, a scalder, if, and in fact, if you go and look, right now I'm on Tractor Supply's website, and as I scroll through and I look at some of the reviews here of the Yardbird, the thing that keeps coming up over and over and over again is, it works great if you get the scald correct. Otherwise, too hot or scalded too long, it'll tear the skin, but it does make plucking much easier than doing it by hand. So that's one of the reviews there. So it goes back to the fact that the scald is the key a plucker is great, and a good plucker is great, but the scald is the key. So anyhow, that's the plucker. Any other questions you have about any of this gear, feel free to reach out to me, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. Um, but again, I, I like my whiz-bang chicken plucker. I probably would not buy it. I, I probably would not build it again. I probably would buy a yard bird. So now you have scalded this bird, you've plucked this bird, it is time for evisceration. Honestly, you don't have to have any kind of a funky knife to eviscerate chickens. Um, a sharp knife, within reason, obviously you don't want to have some kind of a big, huge meat cleaver or something like that. But a sharp knife, a bony knife, a fillet knife, will work for eviscerating chickens. However, I happen to use what is called an Outdoor Edge Razor Light Replaceable Blade Tactical Hunting EDC Folding Pocket Knife. <laughs> now that is a mouthful. Um, but what it is, is it's just a folding knife that has a replaceable blade. And the reason why I use that is because I suck at keeping blades sharp. That is just a skill that I have not been able to master. I don't know if I'll ever be able to master it. And folks, a dull knife will make this job very, very frustrating. And so I just love the fact that I can pop out a blade, put in a new blade, and keep on moving. Um, and so I, I absolutely love it. If you are somebody, though, who can keep an edge on a blade, and that is a skill that you have, then skip the funky, fancy, replaceable blade knife. <laughs> but if you're like me and you struggle to keep an edge on a blade, then I would recommend that you check them out. Now, they're about 26, 27 bucks. Um, and it, I think it comes with five or six blades initially. And then the replacement blades, obviously the cost does add up over time. Um, but at least for me, because again, I struggle with being able to keep an edge on a blade. I just happen to really, really like it. And uh, whenever it starts getting dull and I'm, you know, I just start feeling frustrated, I pop it out, pop in a new one, and keep on trucking. Now, along with that, another thing that I would recommend you think about getting, and again, this is not critical, but think about this that is a butcher's apron. Uh, I love having a butcher's apron on. And the reason why is because as you're doing this, you're going to be using water to spray down your plucker and to spray down maybe even the chicken uh, as you, you know, after you've, you've killed it um, before you scald it, you may want to spray it down. 
You may be spraying down your your work area as as you're working and spraying things off. Maybe you get a little um, poop on the table. You want to wash that off. So you're using the hose a lot. And I absolutely love having a butcher's apron on because it keeps all of that stuff. It keeps the blood. It keeps the uh, the water off of your clothes. And so if you're wearing a nice pair of boots like muck boots uh, and you've got that butcher's apron on, you are nice and dry at the end. Now, of course, uh, if the bird poops on you, <laughs> like I had happen this uh, this time around, and then you have to take a shower out there with the hose, the butcher's apron has lost all protection. <laughs> but uh, I, I do. I absolutely love having a butcher's apron on. Now, you can get disposable plastic aprons, um, and they will work just as well. I just like having that that butcher's apron that I can use over and over and over again. Like I said earlier, my grandfather evisceration station was a 55-gallon drum with a piece of discarded kitchen countertop that he balanced on that 55-gallon drum. And that's what I used for a number of years as I was processing chickens. And in fact, I still do have that. When my dad came down, and helped me process meat birds a couple of weeks ago, I let him use the evisceration table that I have, and I use the 55-gallon drum with that same piece of countertop, which is kind of special using my grandfather's countertop. But I really do prefer the table that I purchased, and I have a link to it. Well, it's not to the exact one. That's one of the ones where they Amazon no longer sells it, but it is to a comparable table. And it's also known as a fish fillet or a game table. And it's just really the right height for you to stand at and to be able to cut on. Some of them will have a sink and a faucet. There are other versions that is just the table, um, but it's just a plastic table. It collapses down nice out of the way and uh, stores very, very well. Now, in the future, I, I think I want to get a stainless steel counter or prep table or something along those lines. I think is where I'd really like to go. But in the meantime, this really, really does work well. I love the fact that it collapses and we can kind of get it out of the way. So once you have eviscerated the chicken and you are done, at that point, you're going to want to rinse it off very well and you're going to want to put the chicken in a chill tank of some sort. Now, I use a 55-gallon plastic food-grade drum that I cut the top off of. I Clorox it out every time, I sanitize it, and then fill it partway with water and throw a bunch of ice in there. And then as I'm done with the chickens, I just keep dropping them in that ice water. And if the ice melts too quickly, I just add more ice. And the goal here is that you're just trying to get those chickens as quickly as you can down to a chilled temperature. Now, some people will use uh, trash cans and they'll put trash bags in them as liners. And then they will fill those trash bags up with water and ice. Some people will use stock tanks, like a Rubbermaid stock tank. Anything that will hold water and ice is, is functional for a chill tank. And you just want to put those chickens in there, let them do a little bit of soaking in that water and ice to bring that temperature down very quickly. Now, again, I am using a 55-gallon food-grade drum as my chill tank. You're not going to buy that on Amazon. You can find those on Facebook, Craigslist, whatever. Um, I do have a link uh, to a picture that I posted on Instagram of that chill tank so you can see it and understand what I'm talking about. So that's one of the things that you can't necessarily buy uh, online unless, again, you're going through Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist. The next step after you have got these birds chilled is you're going to either cut them up into pieces or you're going to want to bag them whole. I prefer to bag mine whole. And so I have built a stand out of PVC. And again, this is one of those things that you can't necessarily buy online. I just built it out of one inch PVC and I've got a link to a picture of it on our Instagram uh, page so you can look at that. It's in the show notes and it's very, very simple. It's got a four-way cross piece in the middle and then some arms that kind of come up uh, off of it 
to, to some elbows. And what you do is you then take your chicken and you kind of put the cavity over top of the arm that's sticking up. And what that does is it allows the water to drain off of the chicken. And then it really makes it very easy if you're using poultry shrink bags to pull the poultry shrink bag down over the chicken. If you're using Ziploc bags, the same thing would apply. Um, if you're cutting the chickens up into pieces, you still may want to build a stand like this because you may want to just be putting the chickens up, letting them dry a little bit before you cut them up just to uh, remove as much moisture as possible from the, the meat um, so that you are minimizing the chances of freezer burn. Like I said, we use poultry shrink bags. I love poultry shrink bags. What you do is you take the chicken and you put it in the poultry shrink bag and you kind of spin it around a little bit um, to kind of start closing the top off. And there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can poke holes, you can put a straw on the top, um, and then you put a zip tie around that to kind of start holding it closed, but you don't zip it all the way closed. And then you dip the bag and the chicken into water that's around 180 degrees in temperature. Now this is where the turkey fryer shines. <laughs> it really does work very well at keeping the, the water more in line with that 180 degrees than the 140 degrees. But those poultry shrink bags are really, really awesome. They really shrink, as the name implies, to the form of the chicken and it really does keep them, it looks nice for presentation purposes if you're going to sell your chicken, um, but it also does keep them very, very nice in the freezer, way better than putting them in a Ziploc bag or putting them even in a vacuum sealed bag. Um, these poultry shrink bags are the cat's pajamas, as they say. <laughs> now, unfortunately, the, the source, I, I went to get the link from the company that I usually buy my poultry shrink bags from, and they are in the process of closing their doors. So I did provide a link to poultryshrinkbags.com, which is run by the same guy who built or who invented the whiz -bang chicken plucker. Um, but I cannot attest to how what the quality is of those shrink bags. I have not used them myself, but he is a, a reputable guy, a reputable source. And I've heard some questionable things about the poultry shrink bags that people get off of Amazon, which is why I did not link to the poultry shrink bags that are available on Amazon, but you certainly can get them there as well. The last thing that we're going to talk about is a cooler. And this year, this was one of the new acquisitions this year for our poultry processing equipment and that was a 120 quart Coleman cooler and that holds about 25 chickens very very nicely and what you do is you put them on ice and you let them rest for 24 to 48 hours before you put them into the freezer. Now in the past I've had a hodgepodge of different coolers around Omaha State coolers, um, small coolers that we had, picnic coolers, and so on and so forth. But this year I did go ahead and get that 120 quart Coleman cooler and it really did work out well to hold my birds. So folks, that is the equipment that we use here on 3B Farm and a homestead. Again, if I were starting out today, the first thing I would buy personally is I would actually, if, if I could only buy one piece of equipment, that I talked about today, it would actually be the scalder. That's where I would invest my money first. Over anything else, I'd still do the chop and drop if I could get a good scald. I'd pluck by hand if I could get a good scald. I'd eviscerate with adult, well, no, I'd buy the knife too. <laughs> Folks, if you have any questions about any of this gear, definitely reach out and let me know. I would be glad to uh, provide you with any information that I can, any way I can be helpful so that you are successful and you are more self-reliant on your quest towards self-reliance, self-sufficiency, and sustainability.
Well, folks, that is it for this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. Again, links to all of those products that we talked about are available in the show notes. So check them out. If you do use the Amazon links, you are supporting the Homestead Journey podcast, and I really would greatly appreciate that. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to this podcast by going to Apple, Google, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, or to the homesteadjourney.net, wherever you like to get your podcast, and click subscribe, and then you will be notified anytime a new episode is released. As always, the music on this episode is provided by Audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.